how nice. have you found the breakfast show? Um, when I did it last week or the one this week? This week's one. Yeah. Um, I thought yesterday, and I said this on air when I had to go in to do an honest review of the show yesterday morning, which is a bit weird. I thought um, that the features were a little bit baggy and a bit kind of long. Um, but I think that he sounded grimy, less terrified than I thought he would. Um, <laughs> because if that was me, and I'd never done a breakfast radio show before, I think that I would have sounded really scared, like I did on my first breakfast show, which was four days into being well, at Radio 1. Th this was what I was looking at. I was reading in, in your book, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, but So you're doing early breakfast on Radio 1. Mm. Uh, day four, um, is, there, is there a ball doesn't turn up? Yeah, so... Um, mm. The producer comes down and says, I've just had a call from um, our exec and uh, Zoe's not coming in. I didn't know why. I think she was sick or whatever. Um, so, or whatever. <laughs> On day four, so um, they said, do you want to do it? And, I, and, then, and they gave me, they did a segue for me and they let me go outside and have some fresh air and think about whether I wanted to do it or not. <laughs> um, and they said, well, we can always call Chris Moyles. And I went... No, and um, so I did it, but I was terrified, and I do still have it uh, somewhere recorded, and yeah, I sound so out of my depth. So you, uh, we'll talk about the kind of chronology of your career in a bit, but obviously you come from heart to do Radio 1, mm. and in the book you talk about that being a little bit of a shock. Yeah. So then to kind of step up to the breakfast show uh, quite quickly, and also, I guess, inheriting that team, was yeah. that a sort of a, an interesting realisation of what Radio 1 was like? Radio 1 was completely different to any station I've worked at before because um, obviously I'd worked in quite formatted radio before that, even at Key in Manchester or GWR in particular in Bristol, as it was at the time. Um, you could have spots of personality, but it was a very tight format, which is fine. But when you get to Radio 1, um, it's like them giving you a blank sheet of A4 paper and going, right, what are you going to do? And if you come from that commercial radio 20-second link background... <laughs> That's quite daunting, because like, what, do, what would I do? I don't know. And um, especially on day four, when obviously the breakfast show has been planned for Zoe and all of her features, mm. that was um, a terrifying experience. What you do have at Radio 1, um, and always have had, is good backup and production, so it normally, that can normally save you. <laughs> so at the beginning, so you started uh, on air at 12? Well... That I, seems a bit young. I was at hospi my hospital radio in Southampton when I was 12 with a really high voice and they would let me tell jokes and do the top 10. Uh, so that was, yeah, I, so I was kind of on air. And then I um, managed to get work experience kind of at weekends at Ocean and Power, as it was at the time on the South Coast, which is where I'm from, um, when I was 15. And then when I was 16... I'd hung around there a lot at weekends and kind of got my face around. And they put me on air once, which, again, was awful. Um, but then they kind of gave me a few more shows. It was lucky because it was the summer and everybody was going on holiday. But, but, st but still, a holiday cover at kind of 16, that does that seem... It's quite mad quite when you young. think about it now. It was young and I wasn't that good. But I was very lucky that um, the guy who was in charge at the time, Chris Carnegie, gave me lots of opportunities to kind of make mistakes on air. He put me on air between one and six in the morning mostly, which was fine. And you remember, at that time, coming out of that building were four different services. So there was a lot of space to fill if people were going on holiday. So from that point of view, I was very, very lucky. So I think there is a, a bit of a, a repetitious thing about interesting people hiring you for jobs. So um, Chris Carnegie sort of very well-respected uh, programmer now, I think it's Solent. Mm. Uh, and then a call from, from Steve Orchard. Yes, um, that was quite a funny one. He, I've had some very strange ways of being, um, of being hired to other radio stations. I remember meet, uh, I had to go and meet Steve Orchard in Wharton Bassett, and it was all very cloak and dagger. Um, then I uh, got a call from Mark Story and Keith Pringle at Piccadilly and had to meet them halfway between Bristol and Manchester. So we had this kind of weird meeting outside Burger King on the M5 services <laughs> at, frankly, <laughs> glamorous. Um, but yeah, I mean, they've all gone to do really, really great things. You were just telling me that Keith is now advising the Z100 breakfast show. Yes, wow. yeah. Uh, and then, so uh, moved to Bristol yes. and then moved to Manchester. I mean, it's kind of... 
a relatively kind of traditional radio presenter thing of having to yeah. kind of uproot your life and take it to a different place. Yeah, and I did. But that. I guess as we come into Manchester, twenty twenty one. Yeah. So that must have been tough. It was tough because I didn't know one person, and everyone here probably knows that you do have to go where the work is. And at that age, I wanted to move on to better stations and bigger stations. And I think it's quite a good progression because the South Coast was you know, fairly small, then Bristol, kind of medium. Mm. Manchester felt huge to me as a marketplace at that time. And then London. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I, moving to Manchester, I literally did it for the job. I didn't know anybody. And also massive characters at, at Key 103 always. Yeah, I mean, I was there when it was uh, Steve Penk on Breakfast... Uh, Danny Petroni was on Drive, who's on uh, Magic now. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a great time. And obviously all the Piccadilly Gold people, the huge, the huge stars in Manchester, like James Stanage and Susie Mathis and Phil Wood. So, yeah, it was a really good time to, to be there. And then uh, moved to London to Heart. Yes. And then probably, was it quite quick then to come to Radio 1? A couple of years. Um, but I was there for the launch of London Heart, which was... Uh, incredible because obviously that was a big FM station you know license to be awarded um, it's a very different station now I think to what to what it was then um, and there was an awkward bit where I wasn't released from my contract in Manchester <laughs> so I would be doing two shows a week on heart in London and six shows a week in Manchester and literally getting the train a lot um, and that, yeah, that continued for six months. So I was there for the launch day of Heart, but then I had to go back to Manchester and ful ful fulfil the rest of my contract in, Man in Manchester. Uh, and then you were sending demos to Radio 1. It wasn't like they suddenly plucked you off the airways. No, I mean, I sent so many demos to Radio 1, like you wouldn't believe, like borderline harassment. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I, w I remember going into Heart really late at night and doing all of my demos on pre-fade <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, playing young people's music and uh, it felt right to me, you know, because I was like 22, 23 when I was doing those demos mm. and it felt like the station I should be at. However, they were not convinced. I mean, I, and I went in to do a pilot for, for them at Radio 1 and I heard nothing back and I just thought, well, that's probably it now and... I mean, I'm talking about a period of two or three years where I would constantly send them stuff and they were like, no, nah, no, 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 no. And then one day, literally after I was, a, I was about to give up because I was like, this is going nowhere. I've been in there. I've done probably two or three pilots. I've met Andy Parfit and this isn't happening. And, and then it did. Um, they just obviously heard something in the, probably the last demo that I was going to send. Um, but yeah, it wasn't easy. Um, it took a lot of determination and, and time, and, they, and, and they, they, they really weren't convinced at all. Well, kind of let's, let's flash forward, and I just want to play a quick video. This is the BBC. Hi, I'm David Hasselhoff from Knight Rider, from Baywatch, from bringing down the Berlin Wall to bringing pleasure to millions. But tonight, it's not about me. I'm sorry about this, Mylene. The one that doesn't speak <laughs> is David Hasselhoff. Kylie Minogue, I, I believe you're performing tonight. Sorry, mate, I've got to get a titty. I'm on stage soon. Stroof! My Pinot Right, uh, give us a text on eight double one double nine. Text on eight double one double nine. Standard rates for SMS apply. I'm sorry, son. I'm gonna have to let you go. You're fired. You're fired, Jack. Reading pornography on the train. <laughs> Don't get too excited. It goes on for hours. So, Scott... Wow. So, Scott... <laughs> it's like so, a school play. From being on Heart to Scott Mills, the musical <laughs> at the Edinburgh Festival. That, that, was, a, that was kind of a... OK, I'll explain it. So, <clears throat> we were given the brief of... 
like Radio One listeners traditionally would think that Edinburgh Festival isn't for them. It's it, it appears to be quite Radio Four, quite arty farty, and it's not for a young audience. And it actually is. If you've ever been to the Edinburgh Festival, there's a lot of comedians you'd know. There's a really young vibe there. There's, I mean, every place in Edinburgh becomes a venue, whether it's somebody's living room or a huge theatre. And there's shows of varying quality, really amazingly good, and loads of truly awful ones, but thousands of them. And they said, you know, let's, let's try and represent the Edinburgh Festival. So we came up with the idea of Scott Mills, the musical, which is obviously a tongue-in-cheek thing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it was quite weird. People, I mean, we, we gave away free tickets to the people that were there. We did the show from Edinburgh all week. And it was just a way of, um, uh, of, of getting, you know, the Edinburgh Festival to a younger audience. Well, it's kind of interesting for a production process because I know that that was the end point. Yes, of a long period of things. But that was the, almost the starting point. Now, you knew where you were going, but on air... You then create a story to get there. Yeah, it's there a, a hu- different way of, of maybe looking at it for some people. Yeah, there was, I mean, there was a huge lead up to it. Um, somebody had posted something on Facebook about um, there's a rumor that I'm going to be in some 80s musical in, at the Edinburgh Festival. Um, so that all kind of played out on air. And then. So that, was that a planted thing? No, it no, wasn't no. planted at all. It, but, but that was an actual poster that appeared. I don't know where from. Um, and then we just, our pro- production team thought, actually, that's not a bad idea and people could watch that the whole thing online um and it, yeah there was a huge lead up to it but on air it was, how, was it like a two or three month period to get to yeah to that bit to get to that i mean that's um, quite a lot of storylining for, for a radio show it is but i think a lot of our show works like that in terms of it is a bit of a soap opera and there are lots of things that you just randomly talk about every day topical stuff but we also <clears throat> a few times a year we will have something like that, or like One Night with Laura back in the day, or Laura's Diary, which, which builds and builds and builds, and, and, and therefore the soap kind of, you know, you go through with the soap. It's like watching EastEnders or watching Coronation Street every night. If you listen every day, then you get the next bit of the soap. And how much is, of that is you versus production team or, um, or Radio 1 stuff? That, all of that was written by my producer, the one that doesn't speak, Emily Dodd, him and, and um, a musical... Uh, guy who works in Edinburgh wrote those songs and they were just kind of silly songs about me it was kind of my life but embellished me getting fired me being drunk a lot me um, kind of embellished embellished yes definitely Um, um, me working at different radio stations and that guy you saw with the bottle of wine in his hand he was playing young Scott Mills in the musical and so Emmeline's impact on the show then seems quite large huge I mean he comes up with all of the stuff that we do i mean me and him mostly uh will get together once a month and just write loads of stuff down most of it doesn't make it to the air some things do like innuendo bingo was a pub idea that we came up with a couple of years ago which is still on now and has actually become you know more popular than ever and people can there's another thing as well people obviously can watch it now on the website which is something that has completely changed in the time that i've been at Radio 1. Does that change how the ideas are created, but also how you have to act? Primarily, um, I'm obviously a radio person, and so is Emlyn. Um, so we always think... I mean, it's difficult sometimes, but pretty much our first love is radio. So we will always think of the radio first, and then we will see if it can work on another platform around it, because Radio 1 in particular are very keen, obviously, to tie in Twitter and Facebook, and you can watch it on the website. And there's so much stuff that you can watch now, like the Chris Moyles uh, 52-hour show, um, like all of the events, the, the, the Hackney Weekend, you could watch on your phone. And I do, I think that's important. When I join Radio 1, you, I, I think you can only just text. And it's, it's, it's evolved so much in that time. Well, Jem's going to talk a bit later about um, all the interactions, especially mm. uh, with Radio 1. Um, in the book, you say, if Emlyn ever leaves you, you'll hunt him down and kill him. I will. Um, we're a team. We've been a team for over 10 years. He completely knows how... I never thought this would happen, because obviously, all the way through my commercial radio life, I never had a producer. It was just me sat in a room. But when you find... And I didn't understand what producers did before the BBC. I was like, well, what, what can they add? Mm. It, they, if you get the right one, they can completely change your show and make your show what it is. And I totally credit, credit him for that. He knows how I work. I know how he works. We have a similar sense of humour. And what I like about him is that if something is a bit shoddy, whereas I might put it on air, 
He won't do that. He won't do it until he is 100% happy with the beginning, the middle, and the end. And I know you, you do hear a lot of stuff on the radio where you go, oh, if only they'd done that, that would have been better. He, and sometimes I would have put that on air, he won't do that. And sometimes I get annoyed with him because I'm like, well, that's a, that bit's fine, but fine isn't good enough for him. And so ideas, are they all pub-based? Someone was saying you're much. quite a listener of international radio as well. I do. I listen around. I'm not hearing anything particularly that I go, that's brilliant. And I don't think that there are any amazing new ideas. It's, it's just reinvention. Um, uh, I, I listen to quite a bit of a American morning shows, but I find that we have... I feel that we've kind of overtaken them now in terms of content. I, I, I feel that generally the UK is better at that now. Whereas I remember growing up as a kid and listening to American radio and thinking, this is amazing. They don't, there's nothing that I hear in particular that for me sets the world on fire at the moment. Australian radio is fine in places, the morning shows, the rest of it is just music like America. So yeah, I mean, a lot of the stuff that we do, it's me and Emlyn that we come up with stuff. And we, don't, we don't change things that much. You know, because I think it's important to let features bed in, and, and some of our features have been going for two, three years. But then we'll do something extra on top, like the musical or like the cabaret show that which we did at the Edinburgh Festival this year, which you could watch on the red button as well. Once again, bringing in the multi-platform thing. We've only got a couple of minutes left, but um, if you want to send any questions in, just use hashtag Next Radio, and I'll try and have a quick look. Um, there's obviously other characters on your show, or there always has been on, on, on Radio One. Um, is when it went from with Chappers, did that, that kind of almost became sort of double acty. Yes. Was that uh, was that a thought out thing, or was that something that evolved? It completely evolved. I mean, he uh, Chappers was on the show before, which was Sarah Cox, who came off Breakfast and then did Drive Time for a while, and he was the sports guy on um, on that show. But he actually is a very funny and very quick witted guy. So. That did kind of evolve where he was just, you know, I, I inherited drive time and therefore inherited him. And it kind of, it just evolved and worked. And obviously kind of Chris and Becky now. Hmm. Could you see yourself doing a show without uh, any on-air support from other people? Yes, and that actually often happens because either or are off. Um, and I actually feel quite comfortable doing that because... I did that for all of my time, and actually a lot of time on Radio 1, like when I was doing Early Breakfast, there was no interaction at all, it was just me. So I'm quite at home with that as well. It's actually, if you get used to working with a team, it's a bit odd when they're not there, mm. and I quite, but I quite like to do it sometimes to realise that I can still do it. And <laughs> I suppose it's just kind of keeping your hand in. For, for keeping that. your hand in, and um, you know, just, I quite like shows that are solo sometimes, I really do. OK, we're just about out of time. A couple of questions about um, Moyles and, um, and Moyles leaving. Mm. Um, how did you feel about that when, when that all happened? Because obviously you've been covering breakfast as well, and that's, mm. people have been saying, well, maybe it's, it's got Yeah, um, It was a really odd thing, because the whole station literally did not know about it. Um, you know what it's like at radio stations. You hear rumours, or oh, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. Uh, stuff gets round. This did not get round at all. They had this on lockdown. And um, the first thing I knew about it, honestly, was uh, Ben Cooper called me at 8 a.m. one morning. And I was like, oh, what have I done? Uh, <laughs> this is not good. And answered the phone. And he's like, you might want to listen to the radio. And it was Chris doing his big emotional, we're coming off the breakfast show. So, uh, yeah, I mean, and also, we didn't know who the new host was going to be. I figured that if it was me, I might have got a call before then. Um, so... <laughs> But no. Um, so, yeah, it was like, listen to Newsbeat at 10.30 to find out who it is. We're like, who is it? And we were all just sat around the radio, like the 50s, like listening. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they, I, I think in terms of leaks, because yeah. that's a huge leak, they, they handled it really well. Um, is it strange with Chris not being there? Yes, because he's been there all of the time that I've been on Radio 1. And um, eight years, eight and a half years is a long time to do the breakfast show. But I said this in an interview last week. You can't think that Radio 1 is forever. It has to evolve. It, it, it's happened before, it'll happen again. And at some point, I don't feel like I'm here at the moment, but at some point, you will be out of touch with it, and you've got to go, and, and, and I will do that. Speaking of which, uh, can I have a round of applause, please, for Scott Mills. 
talking candidly about how he started in radio you think oh god yeah I had to do rubbish jobs like that to start with. It's fun to hear him talk about pre-Radio 1 because you forget that sometimes and he very much still remembers it and it's very much part of why he does what he does every day. Next.